The Record Chronicles, Nashville, Tennessee, suburbs in ruin. Mama said there would be days like this. Wrecker posted Overwatch atop an abandoned silo on the outskirts of the suburb. Before him sprawled the ordered banks of cookie-cutter houses, cordoned off by their grid of subdivision streets. A few old cars sat rusted in the driveways. Some houses were burned, others shuttered. Most ransacked in the intervening years of upheaval and subsequent months of desperation. It was a wasteland that carried the stench of rot with it, even from his lofty perch several hundred meters away. His eyes stung at the occasional gust, making it hard to track the movements of his team as they stealthily maneuvered through the outskirts and into the town proper. They needed resources. They always needed resources. Food, medical, rope, duct tape, glue, hand tools, batteries, you name it. At this point, nothing was wasted and tossed away. They had become professional scavengers within weeks. Suburbs had the potential to be veritable supply caches, but everyone knew that. And as a result, they often carried the only true danger to a human trying to traverse this modern hellscape. Other humans. Squatters, scavengers, they weren't much of an issue. Bands of drug-addled brigands and crazed vicious cannibals employed by the Legion were moderate threats at best. The true threats were the local residents who had created hard targets by doing what people were supposed to do in times of extreme domestic strife. Coming together as a community, forming a local militia. That was the real threat, even for men like Wrecker and his team of resistance fighters who are united in their refusal to go to war but who each also carried their own secret objectives in the hidden chambers of their hearts. A philosophical ally could still be a functional enemy, depending upon the needs of the flesh. Wrecker knew this from his days in combat and in law enforcement, and later even more as a preacher. It seemed both of those seasons were upon him again, folded into an overlapping mantle, that burdened him with each choice, and with each moment of rest he could squirrel away. They were all sleep deprived. Dinah was the first to doze off the night before, but he usually was the first to wake. Lake burned the midnight oil with Casper and some of the others, often electing to take second fire watch. He always paid the price for it the next morning. Lake was usually combat ineffective for the first hour or two of their next day. Such things needed to be managed, navigated, and if possible negotiated. Leadership was as much about properly assessing and maintaining relationships as it was about gear, tactics, and sacrifices. The human element always got in the way, and on occasion it was the X factor that carried the day. Wrecker watched a team of men sneak and slither up to their first house. It was going to be a long day. He settled into his prone overwatch position from the rampart of the silo and took a deep, measured breath. He felt the air fill his lungs and slowly let it out, mitigating his pulse and the adrenaline that threatened to derail it. Something inside of him tingled. Dinah took point, 
his SCAR-17 and EOTech XPS-2 holographic weapon sight making a formidable tip of the spear that could punch through brick, cars, and other forms of cover if they were engaged. He was wiry, and despite his age, nimble. Wrecker would normally object to having someone with his loadout being in the lead role, but he had seen the old biker dodge some very close calls that would have claimed lesser men, even himself. Normally one puts a guy with a carbine up front and pairs him with a shotgunner for breaching or explosive entry and sweeping the threats for response. Nothing said, how are you, like a face full of buckshot at close range. They had that guy, a 23-year-old powerlifter named Hogg. He sported an old Mossberg 590 Mariner pump action 12 gauge. It was nothing special. The record had seen them used to good effect in the desert and saw no liability with a solid, reliable pump action. But Hogg was also the only one with a working sat phone and shortwave radio. He usually rode the flanks, listening in on the enemy comms when he could and staying close enough to blow the hinges off a door if the team decided they needed to stack up and clear a house. Lake was right behind Dinah rocking his Mark 18 with the Trijicon MRO. Fast, light, and perfect for close encounters. The short-barreled 5.56 rifle could dome a Legion conscript at 200 meters easily, but it was balanced enough to sweep corners without resorting to a sidearm. Wrecker once saw Lake dump a mag into two men with underfolder AK-47s at a convoy ambush as they rounded a Humvee and trained a beat on them. That was actually how they met, and Wrecker was grateful for what he would later diagnose as Lake's low impulse control, translating into fast twitch muscle response. He was twitchy, but he at least had the body mechanics to put rounds on target. Dinah and Lake encountered no resistance as they came up upon the first house. Their half of the team stacked up, with Hogg on the right and Casper on the left. The second half of the team took up covering fire and enfilade positions in various positions ringing the house less than 20 meters out just in case there was booby traps or the residents of the town had created a functional security system. A couple men crouched behind an old rusted out Tahoe. Another went prone on an embankment with sections of a dilapidated privacy fence flanking his field of view. Two more set themselves at oblique angles far enough away from the house to see avenues of ingress or egress from any potential combatants. But all was quiet. They had spotted no Legion vehicles in the area. Wrecker's mutilation would probably keep the local myriad investigators busy for a while figuring that one out. Everyone would be on high alert, but no one wanted to go exploring. You put a real target on your back with that one. Dinah had told him earlier that morning. It's accelerated our timetable. We won't be able to linger here much longer before they start sending out hunter-killer teams. Your reputation will precede you, Wrecker. Lake had said, a liability for us the longer you stay. Hopefully not a liability for you once you move on, brother. Everything comes with a price, Wrecker remembered telling them. And now, a few hours later, they were about to find out if such a price needed to be paid. Dinah opened the door to the house. The team scanned from the entryway and flooded in. Wrecker watched them disappear into the shadows of the doorframe like sacrifices to the maw of some dark god. Casper and Hogg followed suit, one with his Colt 6960 combat unit carbine chambered in 5.56 and the other with the Mossberg shotgun. Wrecker waited on bated breath, listening for the crack of gunfire. What's happening? 
Sprite suddenly whispered from beside him. Shh! Wrecker hushed. Not now. Sprite grumbled, and Wrecker could feel the heat of his heavy-browed stare from his side. Even as he tightened up his eye relief and increased the magnification on his six hour 716 scope, a few minutes went by in silence. He saw the flash of a signal mirror from one of the second story windows. Wrecker picked up his signal mirror and flashed a response back in kind. All clear. He came off the scope for a minute to let his eyes and brain relax, knowing that the team would start to peel off from their positions and file into the house while those inside began hardening it at a fallback point from which they could launch further raiding parties. Wrecker didn't like it. He tried to avoid places where there might be people. That's why he stuck to the backcountry. But the situation had developed in a way that necessitated intervention and alteration to their standard operating procedure. He only hoped it was worth it. So your family is still here somewhere? He asked. The sprite nodded. I think so. He took a sip of water from Wrecker's canteen and had provided him earlier. I hope so. Wrecker sighed. Yeah, me too. He stretched his back and shoulders. Let's go find out. They made their way down out of the silo, but not before Wrecker took one last long view of the town through the scope of his battle rifle. Nothing stirred. That was not a good sign. The militia that was here had either moved on or was hunkered down. Hopefully he could link up Sprite with someone he knew before people started doing what people do in these scenarios. The sooner he could get on sight, though, the better. They hoofed it towards the house. Sprite was better at keeping pace than he had anticipated. He handled himself fine on the track from their camp to the silo, but he worried that the nearer they got to a familiar place, the more emotion might threaten to founder progress. To his surprise, Sprite did not react when they came upon the house. Casper was pulling rear guard duty and welcomed them in. Home, sweet home, he joked quietly. Wrecker looked around. He had been with these men for a couple weeks now, slowly making their way west towards the abandoned city of Nashville. He was confident enough in their skill to stick with them, but two weeks was not enough time to take anything for granted. He had began inspecting the reinforcing they had performed on the house. Furniture was cleared from living spaces and braced against exterior doors and windows and tactical arrays that would afford better and even more comfortable shooting positions. Any entry point that was deemed unnecessary or non-advantageous was blocked off with heavier items like old refrigerators or armoires. It was work, because all war was ultimately hard labor. But the team had done this before. They were efficient at it by now. Dinah did a good job of holding everyone together while Lake performed the nuts and bolts of the mission. Casper, Hogg, and some of the other guys were good at maintaining discipline and staying at their post while the others took their turns doing the heavy lifting. It was always tempting to help a fellow comrade with some heavy lifting when you were just standing, watching, and observing your sector. But these guys had figured it out the hard way that doing your job is more important than helping out because you're bored. It was a good team, as long as they stayed lucky. Many parts of the body, Wrecker had told them once. Listen, gents, war is work. Keep your head on a swivel. Find a place to put those guns to work. Stay aware of your surroundings and do your jobs. The hardest part of war sometimes is not being able to stay awake when you're supposed to and trying to sleep while you have the opportunity. By the time they were finished, it was nearly noon. Dinah gathered everyone around in the kitchen. 
It was an interior room. No windows. No chance of some enterprising sniper taking pot shots at them. Wrecker, he began. I think we should move as a single unit with this kid now in tow. Agreed, Wrecker said with a nod. I'll take point with him. Dinah thought for a moment before realizing why and what Wrecker was offering. I appreciate that, my friend. He looked to the others. Okay, Hog, and I will be right behind you, with Lake and Casper pulling rear guard. The rest of you stack in between. Mark this location, however, if you need to use it as our fallback. If we encounter no one, we'll regroup here in three hours. Set your watches and buddy up with someone who has one. No one goes alone. No heroics. We're not here to start a fight, and we can't win them anyways. If we run into trouble or get separated, find your way back to here. Remember the street names. Hog. Jones Street and Acropolis Way, the shotgunner replied. Donna nodded. Jones Street and Acropolis Way. Got it. He cinched up the two-point sling on a SCAR-17. Okay. Let's move out. It was a slow, arduous affair. Minute by minute, the team snaked its way up the streets between houses. Every tenth one, they would stop and perform a search for supplies. Most residents were picked clean. Some were practically loot drops. They scavenged lots of packaged food, jars of peanut butter, fresh batteries, new socks, even unused boots, and various medical supplies. The guys with medical conditions were called in to rifle through the abandoned home's medicine cabinets for anything that they could use. Wrecker took his axe and busted open a couple of suspicious-looking sections of a wall in a house with a bunch of miscellaneous gun-cleaning supplies laying around. Jackpot, he remarked as he found hidden stashes of O.D. green ammo cans and cases of unopened ammunition. There were rifle cases wrapped in tarps that housed multiple small arms, all fully loaded. Within minutes, the team knew what Wrecker had found. It was a feeding frenzy. Hogg jokingly said, Come to Butthead, a reference from an old cartoon the guys would watch as kids before everything went biblical. The men swarmed excitingly as the 9mm, 5.56, 308, 12-gauge, and 45 ACP were divvied up. Wrecker even found some 6.5 Creedmoor for his 6.7.16 though it was not the match ammo he typically used with exclusively. Bird in the hand, baby, Lake said as he leaned over Wrecker's shoulder to observe the dissatisfied look on his face before reviewing the boxes of 6.5 Creedmoor ammunition. Wrecker shoved the boxes of ammo into his field pack and told the team, Hurry up and grab your gear. It's time to move. After two hours of searching, the team decided to turn around and head back to their hardened house. The sun was beginning its afternoon crawl for the horizon. Hogg checked his map, showed Dinah and Casper the way back in case the team was separated. Wrecker had it memorized. Some of the men wanted to press on. A small argument ensued, and many turned to Wrecker for his input. Normally, the veteran would consider reinforcing a new hard point so that any ground covered would not be lost. But something still tingled inside of him, making his hairs occasionally stand on end. Victory loves prudence, Record said, recalling the maxim. All right, drop the cat fighting. We don't need that right now. Tomorrow we'll do this again, except headed in a different direction. Could be a long night, boys, and we made it out like bandits here. Let's get back to the safe house, dig in for the night, eat chow, hydrate, and plan for tomorrow. Roger. Records stared down each man of the team and waited for the acknowledgement. Satisfied with their silence, he nodded and said, Good. Now let's move. 
and do it quietly. We're not safe out here in the open while you're all arguing like a bunch of women. Deal with that drama later. I'll take point. Follow me. The trek back was not as arduous or stressful. Some of the men even joked. The laughter cut short by Dinah's ferocious reprimand and Wrecker's hard stare. Shut the hell up, Dinah said. We're on patrol, not the merry-go-round. The men went from looking at Dinah to seeing Wrecker turned around and staring at them all. You are compromising our security and position. Don't do it again, fellas. One look at his glaring eyes from that half-burnt face of his, and any man riding high on dopamine's swell of humor was instantly sobered up. They knew he was right. Operational security did not end, even on backtrack through already cleared ground. As they neared Acropolis Way and turned east towards Jones Street, a sharp crack rang out. <laughs> Everyone dove for cover where they could find it. Anyone see it? Dinah shouted. Before anyone could respond, another crack barked into the air, and then another, and another. Multiple small arms began loosing their payloads from more than one direction. Everyone scrambled to find the direction of the shooting while maintaining some semblance of safety behind whatever abandoned vehicle, brick mailbox, or pile of detritus that they could find. Confusion set in. No one could pinpoint the direction. Wrecker kneeled beside the corner of a brick house and listened, trying to tune out all the voices of his teammates. Doesn't sound like they're aiming at us, he finally shouted Dinah's direction. Wrecker rose and turkey peeked over the corner of the building and saw Dinah ducked down behind a crenellated structure outcropping of one of the other houses. How can you tell? Dinah shouted back. No impacts from the rounds. Can't see them hitting anything around us. Wrecker barked. Dinah looked around. He saw no areas where the lawns, sidewalks, or streets were being chewed up by bullet impacts. With that volume of fire, surely he'd see impacts in their area of immediate vicinity. Perplexed, he looked at Wrecker and shrugged his shoulders. Whoever it is, said Wrecker as he crouched, ran over to Dinah's position at the corner of the next house. I don't think they're fighting us. Then maybe there's a side we can throw in on, Dinah postulated. Wrecker nodded and said, maybe. Dinah stood up. Team, he shouted, whirling his finger in the air. On me! The men hesitantly rushed to his position, many of them still seeking cover. All eyes were on the old biker veteran. This isn't our fight, but it's about to be, Donna said. We move towards the sound of the gunfire and find out what in the hell is going on. Hog, stay with me. Give me updates if you catch anything on the shortwave. Casper, you and Lake watch our backs as we move. Rest of you follow record. He turned to the hulking, bearded, burn-scarred man. Wrecker's only reply was, You girls ready for some playtime? Wrecker produced his Sig Sauer MCX and nodded. Donna nodded back. Let's do it. The encroachment upon the gunfire was much swifter than any movement throughout the previous day. It was louder and of greater volume by the time they started to smell gunpowder and see the occasional flash from a window. On the northwest corner of the town, a house had caught fire. The dust from all the commotion of the shooting was thick in the air. You could taste it on your tongue. We were literally breathing in the battle frenzy around us. The record chuckled to himself recalling the old maxim that where there is fighting, there is always fire. 
It's like a damn law of thermodynamics or something, he thought. It's the Myriad, Hogg said to Dinah and Wrecker. The rest of the team caught up with him and gathered around to hear the intel. Legion found the militia, where they got ambushed. Hard to tell from the chatter, but someone broke comms on the short wave calling for help. Apparently, some conscripts are caught in that house fire. Nice, Blake said with a ghoulish grin. Casper, Donna said, turning to the albino. Get me a sit rep, and I want num- There was an explosion. Something thunderous and heavy. Everyone instinctively crouched as low as they could go. In seconds, a dark column of smoke started rising into the air. Some of the gunfire stopped, replaced by shouts over a megaphone. Great. They've got a gun truck, Wrecker surmised. Now's the time, Donna said excitedly. Go! The team dispersed and flooded through the streets on either side of the adjoining houses that barred their path to the battlefield. Wrecker had Sprite directly behind him. It was the most calculated risk he had taken in months. He came upon a privacy fence gate, linking two houses, and looked over the planks. What he saw excited him more than anything. On the right were two trucks from the Legion, both outfitted with Browning M250 caliber machine guns. They were pouring heavy automatic fire into the house, neighboring the one that was ablaze. Around them swarmed nearly 20 conscripts from the Legion, with their gray jumpsuits and tactical vests, all sporting pistol caliber carbines or AK-47s. There was a third truck, but it was on fire. The shrapnel and meaty chunks of human remains scattered before the caved-in hood. Someone had hit it with some serious ordnance. Wrecker laughed to himself as the conscripts frantically tried to form a firing line while two or three soldiers, thoroughly out of their minds, attempted to triage their blown apart comrades. It was comically inept. Wrecker thought it was a shame that such resources were wasted on such malnourished, brain-dead fools. Wrecker's eyes traced left to see two houses returning fire from the windows and doors. Half the front of one house was chewed to rubble, while the heavy machine guns punched holes in the facade of the house nearest to the fire. The gunner was seeking vengeance, no doubt, but whoever was inside the house were putting up a fight with well-aimed, well-timed bursts of fire. Wrecker watched more than one conscript try to dart from cover to cover only to be cut down or stumbled with an incapacitating gunshot wound. In moments, conscript corpses littered the streets, blood pooling around their collapsed forms. Meanwhile, the rate of fire did not decrease from the houses. Wrecker had the time to switch back to his big SIG 716 and to aim through the optic. He observed several conscripts in a firing line behind a few parked cars in the street in front of the houses. He couldn't help but chuckle at the irony. Twenty years ago, he was them, and his enemy was some ragtag insurgency freedom fighters in an enfilade position, taking aim with an old infield Mark III. The irony of circumstances was not lost on him as he lined up a shot that would penetrate at least two, if not three, of the Legion's soldiers. He sang the lines from a famous Metallica song to himself while slowing down his breathing and squeezing the trigger. From whom the bell tolls. Before taking aim, he suddenly remembered the kid's sprite. He turned to see where he was behind him. He was cowering in a corner by some trash cans, arms covering his ears. He went over and bent down next to him. Just stay here, kid, he said. Wait until I come and get you. And if you die, he asked, fresh tears reddening his cheeks. Wrecker smiled, a hideous and rare thing giving his burn scars. 
You ever shot anyone? He nodded, sobs threatening to burst forth by the trembling of his lips. Here, you ever use one of these? He unholstered his Glock and showed it to him. The sprite shook his head. It's too big for my hands. Wrecker grimaced, produced his pistol caliber carbine, the SIG MPX. What about this one? Sprite held it. Wrecker was impressed by his muzzle discipline. He seemed to like it. In softer times, he would have chuckled. Instead, he showed him the manual of arms and loaded the weapon. Just don't shoot me, and don't shoot any of the men we're with. Just stay put. I'll be back. Find some cover. Stay out of sight. Sprite took the SIG MPX and set it down across his lap. Wrecker looked at the boy and questioned his sanity for a moment, but figured there was no better option to keep him alive. As long as he stayed there, hidden, and relatively separated from the battlefield, he couldn't be a danger to anyone who wasn't trying to hurt him or rescue him. He only hoped he remembered what Dinah, Lake, Casper, Hogg, and the others looked like. Well, he thought, maybe not Lake. He smirked and rose from his proxy before returning to the privacy fence and raising his SIG 716 to the low ready position, muzzle up at a 45 degree angle and stock pressed against his shoulder. Wrecker thought that the firepower of the Creedmoor and scoped rifle was more of an advantage than his SIG MCX chambered in 5.56 that was still strapped to his back. He thought about how heavy it was to carry three different rifles on him and two pistols, but there was sentimental value in the MPX, which was the pistol caliber carbine chambered in 9mm. That belonged to his wife, and he fully intended on giving that back to her. The other extra burden of steel was his old man's Colt Trooper Mark III. The 357 Magnum was a good backup weapon for close quarters, and he just couldn't beat the cool factor of carrying the heavy wheel gun. With one fluid motion, he took aim at the line of Legion conscripts huddled behind the row of cars, switched off his safety, and began firing. They were in the middle of raising and lowering themselves from cover, taking shots at the house with their weapons. A couple of them even had their bayonets deployed. The heavy green projectile was moving fast when it tore through the neck of the nearest conscript and buried itself in the temple of the man to his right, taking them both off their feet. Blood sprayed and their bodies lurched at the impacts. Wrecker followed up with three more rounds in quick succession, each running lines to the bodies of the third and fourth man in line, entering into their torsos and crumpling them like unstrung marionettes. By now the others saw the danger of his flanking maneuver and swiveled left, training their rifles on his relative position. Wrecker thought the old Marine Corps mindset, close with and destroy everything. Wrecker wasted no time and burst through the fence gate, switching from the 716 to the lighter MCX. Empty brass flew away from him as he walked the interval between them, unloading his magazine on the handful of remaining soldiers who were too scared, and also in each other's way, to react effectively and get a proper shot off. He peppered them with 556 until they were spouting blood from various holes along their thighs and up their torsos to their shoulders. They tumbled back and started screaming. Exposed, Wrecker spotted cover behind the nearest Legion truck, still aflame with its hood smashed in and bodies hanging from its doors. He raced to it, unloading the last of his magazine into the general area of the enemy as he trotted. Wrecker performed a hasty magazine exchange while he had cover and concealment. From his shoulder, he heard the throaty bark of a 308 and peered around the high metal bumper to see Dinah unloading on one of the trucks with the 50 caliber machine gun. The heavy rifle rounds tore through the gunner's exposed lower half, splitting his thighs in great gushes of blood and blowing his pelvic girdle out of his hindquarters. Wrecker always liked the efficacy of a 308, just not the weight of its ammunition. 
The turret gunner was small, and judging now by the screams, a female. Dinah was going to put her out of her misery when Ricker flagged for his attention and gave him the ceasefire signal. The two men approached each other and started assessing the battlefield. Let her scream. Let her screams fill this place for all of her comrades to hear. Fear is a weapon, he would tell himself. She chooses a side with the beast. Now let her scream and cry like one. This fight is not over. We don't have time for this mercy. Where are the men at? Years prior, a statement like that would be called maniacal or offensive. Heck, back before the beast made his evil presence known, it was hard to tell who was or was not a female at times. But the scream, it's a clear indicator. Few men can reach that sound. Even so, the eeriness of the sounds of two voices being heard at once, two screams, like a voice inside of a voice. He never got used to hearing it. The sound reminded him of the various accounts from the Catholic priest who tried to cast out demons from people during their bizarre exorcisms. You gotta understand the situation at hand. These people fought for the Antichrist. They were part of his foreseen army. There was no reasoning with them, no parley, nor negotiations and they were actively hunting down anyone who would resist the rule of the beast. These people ate the living and the dead, and the real prize meal was a Christian. These people drank from the murky cups of satanic priests who promised them immortality and power. They supped up entities who gladly ruled over them. Still the most bizarre sounds were the laughter from the legionnaires as they died but it wasn't the person who was laughing. The demons only cared for the death and pain that they could bestow upon the host's body. As the body died, the demons would laugh upon leaving their broken toys, yet only the chosen people of God could hear them and discern what had actually happened. There was so much smoke in the air, houses on fire, warm bodies losing their lifeblood, scattered all over hell's half acre of the battlefield. Then he snapped back to the scene at hand. Wrecker listened to the baleful tones as the turret gunner cried out in existential agony and collapsed into the truck bed. Dinah's accurate fire did not spare. He let her linger in her suffering, knowing the chaos that would ensue, and as predicted, Wrecker watched a handful of the Legion conscripts race over to her, their biological and anthropological instincts kicking in. Kettled into position, what came next was textbook. Close with and destroy. Dinah and Lake rushed the scene, each taking two of their men with them. They covered the front lawn of one of the houses and fanned out into pincer positions. When they had the obliques lined up, the four men unloaded on the truck bed, slaughtering everyone inside who was desperately trying to white knight their female comrade from harm. The truck bed and its surrounding vicinity was an abattoir. Bodies and chunks of bodies, blown off by Dinah's battle rifle, littered the area around the rear tires. Blood painted the body panels, and it dripped in soupy runnels from the tailgate, courtesy of the female gunner's abdominal evisceration. There was no time to celebrate. The other technical was still active, with its Browning 50 caliber machine gun, expending all ammunition in a blind rage. The gunner's fury diminished his skill, however, and Dinah was able to lead most of the team to the cover out of sight of the gunner's firing line. One of the men got caught in the back and dropped, 
His entrails spitting red goop out of the front in a vicious spray that speckled Donna's boots and Lake's plate carrier. The man was dead before he hit the street. Wrecker couldn't remember the man's name. With the gunner's attention divided and his back to the other trucks, Wrecker rushed his position. He reloaded on the move and panned around the passenger side of the truck. The assault from the boys must have ignited something inside the engine. It was burning. Black smoke billowed out. The wreckage was everywhere. Wrecker methodically walked his way towards the gunner's back, took aim with his rifle and put five rounds into his spine from the lumbar to the cervical. The heavy machine gun pitched its muzzle high as the conscript dropped like a sack of onions into the truck bed, limp and lifeless. Wrecker scanned either side of the vehicle as he approached closer. He was worried about friendly fire being so close now to the enemy's position. Deus Vault, he called out. God wills it, came Lake's familiar baritone on the far side of the street. Cease fire on the gun truck. I'm in front of you. This truck is cleared, Wrecker said. Anyone left? No contact, Lake shouted back. We're coming out. No funny ideas, Wrecker. Oh, don't tempt me, sweetheart. He grumbled, seeking the most advantageous cover around the vehicle that he could. By now the fire from the house had ceased, but the tension was still as thick as the clouds of munition smoke and the burning hulk of the destroyed truck. The house fire still blazed away, but its heat was such that it sucked the oxygen from the lawn and everything around it and sent great clouds of white chalk into the air, high above them. It was actually quite pleasant to watch. The record didn't take long to imbibe its splendor before putting his focus back on the mission at hand. Dinan Lake and their third man trotted up to him. Anyone left? Lake asked as he readjusted the two-point sling on his Mark 18. Donna performed a tactical reload on a SCAR-17. It's very quiet, he observed looking over the scene of carnage. Sounds of the mortally injured female legionnaire's wails could still be heard, but not as loud as before. Dinah said, Finally, she's dying. The possessed sometimes took longer to die than others. We need to make contact with the militia inside the house, Lake said, panting. Wrecker looked back at the privacy fence gate from whence he came. Yep. He turned back to Lake. You wouldn't be sucking wind so bad if you'd lay off the cowboy killers. Lake pulled out a smoke and dug through the chest rig's admin pouch that was mated to his plate carrier. <laughs> hey, baby, I switched to ultralights. Wrecker actually had a good laugh at that one. This guy's all right, he thought. Lake laughingly accused Wrecker of being a hypocrite because he smoked cigars or his tobacco pipe. Wrecker followed up with, Yeah, but my wife says I'm allowed those items for mental health and welfare purposes. <laughs> Everyone had a lighthearted chuckle while gathering their thoughts and planning to hit the next house. There was another burst of gunfire from inside the house. This time it was ragged and booming, not the sharp crack of a rifle or the hardened pop of a handgun. Hog! said Dinah. The four men raced back towards the house, but had to die for cover as the front door began to perforate with quarter-sized exploding holes. One after the other burst through the door into a cracked facsimile of its former self. 
Out sprang two Legion conscripts, one falling backwards and the other running, shooting his handgun wildly behind him as he sprinted from the house. Dinah and Lake laughed. Wrecker watched as Hog casually manifested in the shadow of the lee of the door, leaned against the battered frame, drew a bead on the conscript with his Mossberg, closed one eye, saw Wrecker and winked, then cracked off a 12-gauge slug round that buried itself in the back of the fleeing Legion soldier. The impact dislocated his shoulders and caused his arms to splay out as if he was about to swan dive. The conscript face planted into the asphalt. Lake walked over to him, put his boot on his head, and shot him in the base of his skull with his Mark 18. The 5.56 round passed through the soft tissue of the enemy's neck and fragmented in the asphalt, ricocheting up and ripping the soldier's throat to shreds, like a banana folded in half with the peel still on it. It bulged out and fluids ran over Lake's boots. A small laugh could be heard through the conscript's clenched teeth as he died. <laughs> Wrecker kept his eyes on the house, watching for movement and focusing on the doors and windows. There was a lot of movement inside, and shadows ran back and forth from cover to concealment. He motioned to Dinah and the two advanced. They watched Hogg turn towards the interior and then vanish. Dinah shouted for him, and Wrecker produced his Glock 17, knowing the close-in work was about to begin. When they reached the door jam, they saw Hogg struggling with a conscript carrying one of those bayoneted SKS rifles. They struggled hand-to-hand -hand while Dinah tried to find a place on the interior steps to take a clear shot. Wrecker moved in, bringing his pistol to bear. Hogg's shotgun rang out, filling the room with drywall dust and a ringing in the ears. The two men looked like depictions of colonial fighters in the 1700s fighting musket to musket. Wrecker lost sight of them both, but slowly he crept forward with his pistol at the compressed ready position. More gunshots tore through the sidewall on Wrecker's left at chest height. The two men were running in circles trying to get the angles on each other. He dropped down low, taking cover and darted into the next entryway into the adjoining room. Another conscript was hiding in the corner, the lower half of his suit darkened with urine stains and his arms shaking as he continued to unload his SKS rifle. Wrecker knew those rifles and what they could do, so he laid still until the conscript had expended his ammunition, but then Murphy's Law struck. The conscript's gun jammed and he panicked, trying to fix the malfunction but barely knowing how to work his weapon. These were not trained soldiers. They were demonized killers. They were not professional warriors. This was his opportunity. Wrecker crossed into the room and mag-dumped the bewildered man with his Glock, stitching him from groin to head. The 9mm rounds burst through the man's groin and stomach and knocked him off balance, finally ending with brain matter and skull fragments shattering against the wallpaper behind him. The man stumbled back into a corner and slumped to the ground, forever still. Wrecker immediately cleared the rest of the room, and upon leaving to go assist Hogg, a small laugh could be heard from the deep corner of that room. <laughs> A screaming shout, more like a war cry, tore Wrecker from the scene. He gathered himself in time to see Hogg take a spiked bayonet from the conscript's SKS to the side of his throat, just under the chin. The cubit-long triangular piece of soft steel pierced Hogg's bearded visage and punched out the back of his neck. For a moment, the two stood there, neither believing what had happened. Wrecker, gun up, and cleared his way to the sound of the struggling and made entry into the next fatal funnel. Out from the corner of the house's interior came Casper, dual machetes, hacking and slashing at the back of the conscript and howling like a madman. If it were any other time, this would be the most comical thing Wrecker had ever seen. It was like a video out of a bad movie. Who really dual wields machetes? Our Casper does. 
He screamed and hacked, creating more superficial wounds than anything due to the conscript's body armor. Bereft of a primary weapon, with it still being lodged in Hogg's neck, the conscript yelled out and tumbled sideways trying to escape Casper's wrath. In a moment of frenzy, the beleaguered young legionnaire managed to grab one of Casper's machetes and the two grappled, grunting and straining against one another in the tumult. Casper was stabbing the man repeatedly, but with no real effect. Casper was on his back, fighting for his life, while this demon of a man continued to rampage on top of him, trying to pry the machete from his hands. Somebody kill this guy! Casper shouted at his remaining teammates. I can't get a good shot! Dinah shouted. Casper, hold still! Stop moving! Ricker holstered his Glock and produced his axe. His bulky frame filled the room as he marched up to the wrestling pair and with one swing he hit the conscript in the upper back between the shoulder blades with the large deer antler spike side of his viking axe, splitting the enemy's spine in two. The man went limp. Wrecker yanked out the spike and the legionnaire collapsed onto Casper. The albino rolled him over and quickly stood up, gasping for air. Casper stepped away, heaving for more breath, trying to get his bearings. Hands on knees and then finally kneeling on the floor, Casper watched the possessed man loitering in his last breaths. He wiped his brow, machete still in hand, and he looked across the way to Wrecker, who stood over the enemy soldier with his axe, dripping blood as it hung at his side. The two men met eyes. Wrecker nodded and raised his axe again. A final downward swing on the neck of the dying man, and the fight was over. The body convulsed and stained the debris-stricken ground with dark and bright crimson fluid. A wispish laugh could be heard, echoing off the walls of the room. This was close quarters battle in a way that none had ever experienced. Some things you just can't train for. And it was days like this where the fatigue and horror of these moments would later rob the men of a peaceful sleep. This was a different kind of evil and a whole new level of difficult. It was the blood frenzy of the battle where men would lose themselves, where the instinct to survive took over the needs for mercy and compassion. This was where Wrecker would watch out for the men he was with to ensure that they didn't lose themselves in the battles and struggles with the violence that they saw. Most likely this poor soul was like many others that they had fought prior, hopped up on narcotics and possessed by ancient spirits that have stalked this world for as long as the stories about them have been told. Demonically possessed drug addicts with automatic weapons, body armor, and poor tactics. On days like this, Wrecker would have to counsel the men on the bloody actions they had committed prior. Some men would go silent, eyes glazed over from the ruthless nature of the battlefield, while others just needed to talk and get the inner turmoil out in the fresh air. Lake was a talker. Dinah wasn't. We know now just how important it was to stay in constant communications with the Almighty. No sane man could walk through this current world and not lose hope every day. Wrecker often wondered what the days of Noah were really like. He often wondered, is this the type of violence that was mentioned in the scriptures? But for now, it was back to that strange, foreign silence when the sound of tired and thirsty men breathing heavily would echo off the edge of your sanity, and then you could just barely hear the whimpers of the dying that lay scattered about and the ghostly laughter of their demonic parasites. Wrecker solemnly looked down at a lifeless hog, Dinah holding his hand and praying over him. Casper and the others looked at Wrecker. Clear this house. 
We don't want any would-be heroes shooting us in the back. Wrecker would then stand guard over Dinah while he embraced his fallen friend and battle brother. Aug worked at the garage with us. He was just a kid. Wrecker kneeled down and embraced Dinah with his right arm, tucking his rifle under his other arm and keeping both eyes on the door. I know, brother, but he's with the master now. We will mourn him later. Be proud of him, Dinah. The kid was a real warrior, and he died like one. May we all get the same ending as he did. Come on, Dinah. I'll help you carry him. The team assembled downstairs with Hogg resting across Wrecker's left shoulder in a fireman's carry position. They placed their friend near the front door of the house and took up positions, while a pair remained outside for site security. It was quiet again, but the numerous fires were still blazing. Dinah and Lake were discussing taking the radios and the trucks when Wrecker went back for Sprite. To his surprise, he was still there, and still intact. He took the MPX from him and cautiously led him back to the house. Keep your eyes on me, kid. Don't look down, alright? I've seen this before, sir. He softly mused. Record jerked his arm. It doesn't mean you have to see more of it. I'll do as I say, boy. Spare me your nightmares tonight. Please. The two made their way over to the house. Jesus is Lord! Came an unknown voice from the second floor of the house. Christ Jesus be praised! Dinah, Lake, and the others jerked up at the sudden outburst, guns raising, and most of the team fanning out into a more secure position in the house's first floor, eyes on the stairs and ceiling. Each man took up a spot that would lend itself to overlapping fields of fire. Wrecker saw them disperse via the windows as he approached, but the tingling in his guts was gone. There were footsteps coming down the stairs in the house they were just in. Hey! We're coming down! Came another unfamiliar voice. Don't shoot! Dyna Scar 17 was trained on the stairwell. Stay sharp, boys. Were they in the house with us the entire time? Lake asked with a bewildered look on his face. Good job searching the house, guys. You only missed three people, Wrecker annoyingly stated. Casper demanded to know where they were hiding inside the house, and Lake followed up with, Let me guess. You got a safe room up there. The middle-aged man replied quickly. No, sir. We were in the upstairs master bedroom. We heard you guys fight in the Legion and thought, well, we may have allies here with us. We heard you guys going downstairs and then that man with the cigarette in his mouth walked right past our open door to the room where we were hunkered down in. That room was going to be our Alamo moment. It was at that point that everyone on the team stared at Lake. Lake raised his hands in defeat. All right, all right. I messed up, and I missed the room. My bad. Yeah, we thought you would have seen us since you were standing in the door, lighting your cigarette, but then you just turned around and you headed downstairs. The man chuckled with his arm still raised. Wrecker gave that one-of-a-kind stare at Lake and said, You're bad, huh, princess? You're walking around with your head down inside a house we just had a firefight in and that you were supposed to be searching. By the throne, man, if I could, I would Darth Vader force choke you into the ground in front of everyone. We are gonna chat about this later, bro. Roger, Roger, was all Lake gave back for his reply. 
He knew he messed up royally, and he knew an elemental ass-chewing was in his future. Lake was an army veteran. He knew CQB, close quarters battle tactics, but he never deployed to a combat zone. There was a difference in men who had seen combat and those who didn't. Lake would take the chewing out like a man, and the two would probably laugh afterwards. That's just the way it was in that line of work. The new strangers were searched and told to sit down on the ground. It was a man and two women, all adults of varying ages. The man looked to be 50. The women were younger. It looked like most of the resistance fighters Wrecker and the team had encountered. These were just more gaunt than usual, but wide-eyed, with that kind of keen sense and feral ferocity that belied a survivor's instincts. They did not have the sallow, thin-haired look of the cannibals, nor the full-faced look possessed like the Antichrist legions and their murder squads. Wrecker had seen their type many times before. They were legitimate, if not also extremely lucky. The newcomer's eyes fell upon Sprite, and the group came unstrung. They sprang up and rushed to him with open arms, and Sprite did the same. This was the family we were looking for. Thank you, the oldest woman wept. Thank you, oh my god. She clasped Sprite to her chest and hugged him as tightly as she could, and the pair sank down to the hardwood floor of the house. We thought the Legion wiped all the others out, the man told them. This was supposed to be our Thermopylae after they took our children. Wiping tears of joy from his eyes, this would be Sprite's father. We were just passing through, man, Donna told them. Probably why we hadn't encountered a lot of resistance yet. You're the first we've seen in weeks, said the younger woman who would be the older sister, Sprite now held tight in her arms. The Legion was pretty good about wiping us out after they sent the local Myriad running back in October. The Myriad, the name given to the Christian freedom fighters who chose to stand and fight the armies of darkness wherever they could. Bit off more than you can chew, huh? Lake teased. Sprite's father awkwardly looked at Lake, but didn't respond. He then looked back at Dinah. Well, now that we have her son back, we... we don't know what to do, Sprite's father confessed. I guess we should just hit the road and get the heck away from here before more come. No, we're not leaving, Sprite's mother said defiantly. You said it yourself. This is our home. We'll die here if we must. You almost did, lady, Lake observed. Dinah placed a hand upon his shoulder. He walked away, shaking his head, and lit another cigarette. Wrecker, I'll take a few guys and go back and get our fallen. Hogg was still at the front of the house, and the young man was due a warrior's burial after all this was over. If you're looking for a mission, Wrecker finally acknowledged Dinah and then turned to Sprite's parents and said, There's a killing field a few miles from here where they sacrifice kids around an altar. I'll show you on the map. It's fairly well hidden behind a glen half a mile up from a waterfall. It was some sort of park or tourist attraction. There's a satanic priest that's running the show there. A witch. You want to put a dent in their plans? Kill her. With each bit of new information, the family grew more excited. To rescue the weak from the cruel was the Lord's business, and they wanted to help out however they could. Sprite's father looked at Wrecker and Dinah and said, Well, to die is gain, gents. Let me get my gear. We can plan all this out. 
Will you come with us? Sprite's father asked. It's just us now, but I think I know where the others of our group are hiding at. Maybe we could find them. We could all band together. Dinah and Wrecker exchanged looks. Dinah arched an eyebrow. We could use you, Wrecker. Wrecker thought for a moment before wiping his axe clean and sheathing it back in the frog at his hip. My mission is different. I've already lingered here too long, brother. Dinah nodded with the resignation, expecting such an answer. Yeah, yeah, man, I know. I understand, said Dinah. What could be more important than taking out this witch and saving kids? The man protested. You want to hurt the Legion, don't you? You and my wife would really get along, Wrecker said. Wrecker steeled him with a gaze. I have a family of my own that I need to get back to, brother. Your fight is your own, sir, but I have to head to Texas. Though, in my dreams, one day there will be thousands of us fighting thousands of them Ten myriads times ten myriads, fighting even more myriads. But that day isn't today. Do not fear. The Lord is your shepherd. God is with us. His love surpasses all understanding. Rescue who you can, and stay in the shadow of the Almighty. Have patience and endure. Our King returns soon. Sprite's father laughed. Huh, what are you, some kind of a preacher? Record locked eyes with him. Yes. A moment of impasse ensued. Eventually, the man spoke. Ah, well, <clears throat> the Lord works in mysterious ways then, Mr. Record. I wish you'd stay to help us, but he looked down at his son. You already have. Thank you. He extended his arm. I owe you a debt of gratitude I can never repay. Wrecker shook his hand. Let's forget I was here, he said grimly, indicating Dinah and the others as well. And kill that priest. Suffer not the witch to live. On his way out of the house, Wrecker stopped by Lake, who was on his third smoke. He stopped long enough to pluck the cigarette from his compatriot's lips and took a drag off the cancer stick and flicked it onto the lawn of a bullet-ridden suburban home. Smirking at Lake and blowing out blue smoke as he started back down the street, he heard the man curse his back, but he only smiled more and kept walking eager to get out of this war zone. Those things are going to kill you, you idiot. Don't you want to live forever? Wrecker said while turning around and walking backwards. Lake shook his head and looked at the cigarette, laughing to himself. Before Wrecker could round the next corner, a thought of his wife crossed his mind, and again, he stopped in his tracks. He envisioned his children and their mother, waiting expectantly on the farm, looking down that long driveway that led to their home, patiently waiting for his return. Donna and Sprite's father caught up to him with the team and newfound members in tow. Wrecker, wait up, man, Donna yelled out in his thick Appalachian accent. Listen, man, it's better if we stick together. We understand you want to go home. Our, our homes are destroyed. And the only thing left is this and the boys. Donna gestured, looking around at the hellish landscape surrounding them and the team of brothers who were all watching the conversation between them. 
Look, man. We want to go with you, Dinah said. Sir, we have strength in numbers, and frankly, I owe you. I owe you my life for saving my son, Sprite's father said. Besides, man, it's going to be dark soon. Plus, we're all tired and we need a rest. Even you have to rest. And like he said, Dinah thumbed up the man to his left and then asked, Hey, brother, what's your name? It's Charles. The two shook hands and exchanged pleasantries and introductions. Like Charles here said, there's strength in numbers. Dinah suggested hunkering down for the night somewhere outside of the latest battleground. Let's rearm, eat, and rest. Then we can plan out tomorrow and look at the maps again. Record, there is strength in numbers. And these people need a good leader. They don't they don't want to stay here. And neither do we. Let's let's come with you, brother. And we will help you get back to your family. Wrecker stared at Dinah for some time, saying nothing. His emotions were churning like a sea storm, and his thoughts of his families were tossed like the waves. He didn't want to be slowed down, and a big group could bring a lot of attention, but also could be beneficial. Though, it would make hiding harder when the moment came but he trusted in the Lord, and he knew these men were all godly men. Later that night, Wrecker broke bread with the group and led them in prayer. He offered counsel to anyone who needed it to get this day's carnage off their chest and out of their minds. His intent was to be a spiritual leader and a moral compass to the men that he was with. He had learned many years ago of the importance to seek the Lord after days like this and to repent of whatever came to mind and to praise God for the life they had, no matter how rough. The men talked about the next day's goals and planned out routes based on the maps they possessed. After this, the men were assigned their night watch shifts and started racking out. They were just barely as big as a standard Marine infantry squad which allowed for two people to be on watch during the night shifts. Two men were always better than one. The deeper parts of the night were always the most difficult to deal with due to the ever-increasing dangerous environment they were in. Not to mention two men awake would mean that you have someone else to talk to, which helped to pass the time. Before racking out for the night, Wrecker lit up his simple, short-stemmed corncob pipe and stared at the pictures of his family. This is what drove him to do the things he did, even if he didn't always agree with how things were done. He wasn't a Marine at war or cop patrolling the streets anymore. He was a worried husband and father who missed his family and cursed himself every day for taking this stupid job that got him stranded 900-something miles away from his family. After a while, the pipe was put out, and he hit his knees for the final time that day, with not much to say except for what was on his mind and what was in his heart. Lord, protect my family and keep them safe. Tell my wife and children that I'm on the way to stay where they are and I will see them soon by sword by gun or by bare hands I will fight my way back to them dear Lord bless the works of my hands please continue to shelter us under your wings please continue to be our strong tower and mighty defender God is with us and God is for us. He will never leave us. And I will never leave him. 
Praise be the lion and the throne. We wait for you, King Jesus. Praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. He got off his bad knees, took off his gear, and began his daily pre-sleep stretching routines. After limbering up, changing his clothes, and putting on less smelly ones, Wrecker got geared back up and found a place to prop himself up for the night. His pipe now stuffed full with the precious tobacco that he found was smoldering again for the last time that evening. This is how you slept now, in full gear, with a readied rifle in hand. The group would sleep in one room with the least number of windows for the protection it gave. While the two on fire watch would patrol the abandoned home that lay about a six hour walk west of the embattled suburb they had nearly escaped earlier. Except now, they were one man short. The loss of Hogg hasn't set in yet for the group, but his lighthearted humor and youthful presence was missed tonight during Chow. How many more will they lose before this is all over? And can you really even count it as a loss? Hogg fought and died for the Lord. To die is gain. Tonight, an exhausted and paranoid group of survivors pretend to sleep peacefully in a dilapidated homestead that nature had already taken back for itself. Tonight, the team mourned the loss of a brother. Today, a soldier for God was given his crown and new name by the master himself and told, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Praise God. Casper is cleaning his guns now and adjusting his gear, checking his boot laces on his new boots and putting on a light jacket. He was stationed at the front of the house where the kitchen is located. There is damp in the old abandoned homestead. It must have been a farm during its better years. They found the house on accident by walking down an old dirt road that led to an even narrower dirt road that eventually led to a barbed wire fence and an open vehicle gate. In front of the gate, on the left side of the driveway entrance, was a standard black mailbox that was badly leaning over next to it. The mailbox said, Granny and Papa." The property was about 10 acres or so, that was nestled deep into the woods and many miles away from the nearest highway. The home was old, half made of hewn stone and half log cabin. A fallen down front porch roof obscured the front door upon approach. The team carefully observed the property for about 20 minutes and then split up into two columns and made their approach. Dinah hollered out for anyone who may be hiding in the structure, but there was no response. Dinah, Wrecker, Lake, and Casper made entry into the home by the back door, which was unlocked. They searched the single-story home and found not even a remote semblance of human activity. Vines had begun to creep up the sides of the house and along the metal roof. A family of raccoons were investigating the team on the outside, which caused a comical standoff. The home was pronounced clear, and Dinah sent the other team to search the barn and adjacent structures next to it. The only thing was found was an old beaten down tractor and some accompanying equipment. It was strange how it seemed that the forest was reclaiming the domain of man here. The yard was covered in tall grass and new saplings of the native trees in the area. A creek could be easily heard from the barn, which meant good news. The group could bathe, rinse their clothes, and get water tomorrow after the rest of the area was cleared of any unknown threats. Lake was up, watching everyone sleep and sipping on a canteen of water. 
He would overlook the back porch from a vantage point he found near the back door while Casper watched the front. He would lean against the inner wall that would lead to one of the two bedrooms of the cabin. He could see out of the large windows that sat opposite either side of the back door. The moon was so bright that night, it was like a street light was perched in the backyard. A family of raccoons were playing just off the steps of the back porch. Lake began to reminisce of home, and his thoughts would drift to better times before the world was under the rule of the false messiah. As he lights his cigarette, he quietly sings to himself. Mama said there'll be days like this. <laughs>